Hello and welcome to episode 6 retrospective review, I want to hear your voice. This episode is all about a humor gear voice actor, so what better way to introduce it than with TTS demo. A jump to the sky turns to a rider kick. Spread your wings and prepare for a force. Oh, what was that? Did something happen? No matter. Let's get into it, shall we? We're introduced to Humor Gear voice actor Sena, whose name I assume is a play on Say You, Say You, Sena. And at first, the dynamic between her and the human who bought her seems nice, but that doesn't make the whole thing any less weird. Actually, I'm gonna be a little bit sympathetic in this episode, I think. I think. Well, understanding maybe. <laughs> Let's find out. Ames are hanging around this production. They're recording what I believe to be an anime adaptation of the manga from last episode. And by Ames, naturally, I mean Hua. And so Adato and Izu are also hanging around the production to find out what the bloody hell Hua is after. I'm glad that the one display of trust in episode 4 didn't all of a sudden mean they totally trust each other all the time now. I like that they're taking their time with it. I do wish this is how it was with a lot of other people. I just don't like sudden changes when they really should be working to get there. So I'm glad their dynamic hasn't all of a sudden changed just because of one act. Insane and meows. Oh, she's so cute. I'm in love. Fu comes in saying that the guy responsible for Sena, Tazoa Seiji, is under suspicion of violating Article 6 of the Special AI Code, which is that you can't make a human gear look like a real person without their explicit consent. Which is fair, of course, that shouldn't happen. I really bloody hate most of the AI laws we learned throughout the series, but this one I agree with. Because we all know what happens when people are allowed to make AI look like real people. They make them look like people they hate and torture them. And that's how Drive happened. Side note, Krim got mad at Bano because he made the Roy Mew take on a human appearance. And I have to ask, one, why is that all he takes issue with? And two, how did he even know that was hard to begin with? And not actually the guy who looks like him, unless Bano routinely tortures him. Why did Krimla open the door and go, bloody hell, Bano, you kidnapped a guy? <laughs> anyway, that's nothing to do with this. Then we get Jin, and he's sucking his thumb, bless him. And he's looking up what son means, which means, right, that he's gone all this time without knowing that he's Harvey's son. How did he get to this point without knowing this? Unless the arc specifically prevented Harvey from letting Jin find out. I mean, Harvey's whole thing is that he wanted to be a dad and succeeded. There was no trying about it. He is Jin's dad. But that's his thing, so that's what he wanted. And family is a very human concept for someone who allegedly hates humans. So I'm not saying it was obvious all along, but... Maybe they just never had any reason to talk about it until now. However, he isn't going out of his way to freely offer information in the beginning. But he answers any questions Jin has, so Jin just clearly hasn't had a reason to ask yet. Anyway, here's what I personally think. Last episode, Jin wanted a progress key of his own, but Horribly told him not to go after one. I mean, that would be a pretty dangerous thing to do, right? That would involve Jin actually getting close to a fight. Up until now, he's just been packing a humor gear and stepping away to watch, and Harvey subconsciously doesn't want his son in danger, even though he doesn't know that's what he's thinking. He still is, it's still there. <laughs> Harvey's desire to be a parent is the one thing the Ark couldn't get rid of. I mentioned before that my theory is that Harvey was easiest to manipulate because he already specifically wanted a world that was safe for his son, and it was that desire to protect humor gear and that love for his son that gave the Ark an in. And the Ark has managed to essentially strip away every part of Harvey except those core things, including his love for his son. And the Ark can only suppress that so far. I mean, the Ark isn't particularly strong at this point. Either that, or the Ark isn't actively trying to repress those feelings entirely because that was what made him easy to get to in the first place. So the Ark doesn't want rid of them just to control them enough. So like, Harvey subconsciously was like, no Jin, don't do this very dangerous thing. But the Ark was like, 
No, okay, but actually do though. And later on, Hoggy says specifically that kids should do what their parents tell them. So it makes sense that the Ark is controlling Jin through Hoggy. My long-winded point is that I see this as one of many hints towards Hoggy's actual feelings, if that makes sense. I see these sort of parental feelings emerging ever so subtly. Anyway, I have more to say, but later. It's so nice to go back to early episodes and see just how far Hoggy has come despite the excruciating lack of content. I mean, the villains don't usually get that much at the beginning. They just tend to get a few cryptic moments here and there hyping them up for their big grand moment when they finally start interacting with the outside world and doing stuff. But having villains talk cryptically in their dark hideout is perfectly regular for early episodes. It's not supposed to say like that! Especially, you know, when they're one of five main riders in the bloody intro, when they're a part of that one shot of the five of them together that made people think they were all going to work together in the end. Ha, <laughs> that's hilarious! Anyway, I said I had more to say later, and then immediately starts talking about it again. <laughs> we're only three minutes into the actual episode, oh god. Turns out that Tazawa Seiji's daughter died, so he ordered, ew, a humor gear that looked just like her. Which is exactly why being able to customise humour gear is weird! But before we can get into what that means, which we are going to do, FIGHT HAPPENS! Sena is attacked and injured, Tazawa Seiji protects her and says she's my child, and Jin stops and he just doesn't know what to do. Which is a wonderful parallel to the farm scene where the writers remembered how existed and he attacked and the dad protects him and is like, don't hurt my son! And Hobby is like, son, I see, you're a parent and child, and has a moment, and then attacks the dad instead. Which I had a whole thing about, maybe I'll be clever and link it in the cards, who knows, my memory is a sieve. <laughs> Sena has clearly gained singularity, or is on her way to. I have so many feelings about this particular story, and I'm not sure I can articulate it well, so I'm going to have to take my time with it. I believe that Sena legitimately considers Seiji to be her dad. I think, given that he's clearly treated her as his daughter, I think she considers herself to be. And after she's rebooted, after the, her earpieces are damaged in the fight, she starts calling him Papa. But then when she realises where she is, and he's been begging her to call him President, and not talk like that in front of people, she looks and sounds genuinely sad. I feel like she considers him to be her parent and wants to be considered his daughter, but knows she's just replacing someone and it isn't real. That's just how I see it. It's difficult because there's no obvious mistreatment going on here. There's no overworking her until she collapses. There's no physical violence. There's no generally saying mean things to her and he's done this because he's grieving and clearly has not received the help he needs because therapists don't exist in Kamen Rider World and it's just one of those things where it just really lends to why customising humour gear appearance is just disturbing. He's also clearly told her to call, her, to call him Papa which is just ugh. Isn't it? <laughs> He's not being malicious, and I can be sympathetic to a degree, but that doesn't mean the whole situation is any less disturbing. He still uses poor humour gear. And a case could be made that he's grown to love her as her own person. But the fact that he doesn't seem to fight for her, he just kind of gives up and says, I'll return her tomorrow, it's... He's acknowledging the violation, but if he really cared for her herself as her own person, wouldn't he be fighting more for her? But then, given what happens later, I don't know. <laughs> I just genuinely don't know whether we're supposed to think he's actually come to love her as her own person, or if he's still just using her as a replacement daughter. It's complicated, and I'm not going to pass judgement on that yet. This is also an episode where Adato's supposed compassion really shines through. He tries to keep Fua away from Seiji, trying to make him go easy on him. He could have insisted on just taking Sena right there and then, but he let Seiji have one more day with her. He even... Seiji only asked for one more day, but Adato was like, he has an audition in three days. That's compassionate! That's putting feelings over the company. He doesn't need to do that. 
Before it even says so, Hedon's turning a blind eye to an illegal humor game. This is going to reflect badly on his company, but he's doing it anyway. Says she asked for a day. Arato shouldn't give him any, but he's bargaining with Fur to give him three. But it's just the human that gets the compassion! This is for him, the human only, not the humor gear that's been exploited in all of this and is going to be decommissioned or killed because of it. It's not let her live, it's let the human have more time with her. There is no sympathy towards the human gear who's going to have to suffer the most because of this situation. Jin asks Horabi if parents are supposed to protect their kids and Horabi says he's old enough to not need protecting. And again, it's so nice to look back and see how far Horabi has come. <laughs> oh honey. <laughs> to be honest, as soon as I heard that line I thought, Okay, so Harvey's totally going to protect him at some point and it's going to be a big statement, right? <laughs> and to think I thought the episode where he died was the big protecting Jin moment. Oh, past Saf, you sweet summer child. <laughs> then Harvey says their relationship isn't like a typical father and son relationship. Oh, honey. <laughs> That's really sad now. Imagine how the two of them could have been without the bloody arc. Actually, Harvey would just be stuck at Daybreak without the arc, wouldn't he? Huh. <laughs> View a lot to the arc. Saying herself's having an identity crisis. Has she been installed with data on Seiji's daughter? She's having flashes of her. If that's what happened. Of course the poor girl is having an identity crisis. This is just... Like I said, I can award a little bit of sympathy, but this is just cruel to put on Sena. Also, I just have to say, all these actors who play the humor gear of the day, they're all so good at playing a glitching AI. And Seiji's like, don't destroy her, she's my daughter, Sena. So that's what then led me to think he does genuinely care about her, Sena. Not as humor gear who looks like his dead daughter, but still, I don't know. <laughs> Things aren't always black and white. Things can be more complicated than that. Jin asks why he's protecting her, she's just a Magia now. Because, right Jin, I know I get mad at Anatoa in a sec for the way he answers this question, yes I'm a hypocrite, but because Jin, right, people tend to care about their family, even if they get hacked, I know this must be a difficult concept for you. Oh no honey, sorry. Oh, I don't want to be saucy at Baby Jin. It wasn't Baby Jin's fault. Baby Jin would never do that. Anyway, sweet adorable Baby Jin asks Anato this and he's like, you don't even understand something so obvious. No, that's why he's asking. I know in hindsight I get bothered by a lot more now than I did originally, but this is definitely something that got to me even then. Okay, we as the audience can tell that Jin is not okay and needs help and somebody perhaps should be reaching out to him. And there are so many instances where it's obvious someone needs help but no one is exactly trying, but... Oh, I hate to say it, but I want to say that in this one occasion I do understand. This is still early, Adito doesn't know stuff yet. I understand him not immediately going, oh, oh, this poor Metis Boy Jinai person seems to be suffering, we should help. Although, you know, that's what a compassionate person would do. <laughs> But to a degree I do understand, but it's still just one of those things where we are seeing this poor guy struggling and then the hero is just completely unfeeling about it. He then goes on to say protecting their kids is just what parents do, they'd even die if it means protecting them, that's just how parents are. Which, I mean, obviously it's in regards to Soyo, but also foreshadowing! And if he'd have just said that, even in the tone that he says it, that would have felt more like a passionate speech for me hero, but the fact that he starts it with you don't even understand something so obvious just ruins it and it makes him seem kind of a, well not a very nice person. Jin is now in visible pain and is hearing Horvey say that he's old enough to not need protection and children should listen to their parents and tries to remove the key and save Sena telling her to run and then and then and then the music starts and we get Harvey out in the open and Jin says you came to protect me right and Harvey says wrong Chigal and what an opportune moment just to just remind everyone that Harvey was hacked by the Ark at this point and I want to say this is the first time we've ever really seen him be harsh towards Jin which is important for a later episode. Jin is revealed to be a humor gear and he's zetsmerized and ah, I was right. We were all right. I remember feeling such vindication. It's a painful engine, he's screaming and falls to his knees. Very symbolic. But this is the only time Jin goes, Metsubo Jin Nai Netoni, Sok. 
after that he just henshins normally and he's giggling during the fight so he was lying hacked at that moment does that mean up until now he was not was he already hacked but he was just reset then because he doesn't seem that perturbed by anything that just happened and it's like he was gaining the wrong singularity in the arc and he just put a stop to it it's also so sad to watch this scene now knowing this is one of the flashbacks however he has right before finally breaking free like he's reliving all his regrets, all the things the bloody arc made him do. So ordinarily a humagate is revived after they're hacked and killed, but Sena isn't. Seiji just gets his daughter's voice in a glorified Alexa. Sena has nothing to do with it now. And I understand, but why couldn't she just be given a different face? I mean, that just proves that he didn't care about Sena as a person. He cared about her as a stand-in for his daughter, and as long as the human's happy, that's all that matters, right? So, now we know, it wasn't Sena, it was purely the fact that she looked like his daughter. He's totally happy without Sena specifically in his life. Aruto says humans can't live without something to support us, AI can give us that. And yes, but maybe also consider supporting AI too maybe, and not be so self-centred towards humans. <laughs> Oh, I could just feel myself getting more and more cynical. Next episode is a teach episode and I'm going to drink some chamomile tea during that one to soothe me.